We will now resume proceedings in Finance Committee for today, Thursday, June 16th, and we will continue to consider the appropriations with which, for which the Premier has responsibility. Today we'll be considering appropriations to the Minister of Home Affairs, Health, and Culture, and this morning primarily Home Affairs. I received apologies from Captain Eugene, and I will now ask Mr. Eden if he would lead us in prayer. Let's bow our heads. All-powerful, most wonderful, Heavenly Father, through your precious Son, Jesus, we are coming to your holy presence. Beginning for the deliberation and the budget, we ask for your guidance. We ask you for the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding to do that which is right for our people. But above all, that what we do will be done for the honor and glory of your name. We thank you for the multiple blessings and miracles bestowed on these islands because of prayers and commitment of a genuine Christian. We ask for your continued guidance as we go forward. Bless all of our families far and near. Keep them healthy, keep them safe. And may we focus our lives on your eternal kingdom. We pray for peace in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. The first appropriation being HCA1, Policy Advice and Ministerial Services on Home Affairs Matters, $4,585,019, found on page 5858 of the plan and estimates. Are there any questions? Mr. Eden? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am making a special appeal to you and I've shared with the Premier of certain actions that has taken place in recent times, which I think most of us are aware of. You heard me refer to prayers that have been answered. And I think it is one of the greatest moral successes of these Cayman Islands, what has transpired under the European Court of Human Rights. And I would like to read into the record for posterity as it affects these Cayman Islands. And I want to take this opportunity to thank our Premier that in the negotiations for our new constitution, in section 14 of our Bill of Rights, where he had put in place, government shall respect the right of ever unmarried man and woman of marriageable age freely to marry a person of the opposite sex and found a family. And in my limited knowledge of law, Madam Speaker, this is borne out in the ruling on the European Court of Human Rights out of Strasbourg, France. And I will quote, this article, Mr. Chairman, was written on June the 10th, 2016. Reserving marriage to a man and a woman is not discriminatory. This was confirmed by a ruling of the European Court of Human Rights, published yesterday. In the case Chapin and Charpentier versus France, known in France as the Marriage of the Beguiles, the court unanimously found that Article 12, Right to Marry, taken together with Article 14, Prohibition of Discrimination, and Article 8, Right to Respect for Private and Family Life, taken with Article 14, were not violated. This means that the French state preventing two men from marrying did not violate the European Convention for Human Rights. Just to put it aside here, when Mr. Wintermute and then came down to that big conference, they were going to 
say that we must change our laws to adopt to these things. As explained by the Registrar of the Court in May 2004, Mr. Chapin and Mr. Charpentier submitted a marriage application to the Civil Registry Department of Bagels Municipal Council. The Municipal Civil Registrar published the bans of marriage. The Public Prosecutor of the Bordeaux Tribunal de Grand Instance served notice of his objection to the marriage of the Bagels Municipal Civil Registrar and on Mr. Chapin and Charpentier. Despite the objection, the mayor of Bagels performed the marriage ceremony and made an entry to that effect in the registrar, register of births, marriages, and deaths. Having been dismissed at every stage of the French judicial system, the plaintiffs appealed to the European Court of Human Rights, contending that they had been discriminated against on the basis of their sexual orientation. Yesterday, the European Court of Human Rights confirmed the decision of the French Supreme Court, Court de Cassation, affirming that there is no discrimination if the state denies the right to marry the two adults of the same sex. This is good news, as it shows the competence of the states that have ratified the European Convention on Family Associations. Human rights must be respected on matters related to family and marriage, says Antoine Renard, president of the FACE. We welcome the fact that this time the convention has not been the object of a subjective interpretation and encourage all national and international institutions to take this decision into account. Marriage, that is, the union between a woman and a man in view of founding a family is a unique institution that must, and I emphasize must, be protected. This decision comes as a historical moment as some European countries are denaturing the institution of marriage in many cases under strong international pressure which is not justified by any treaty or agreement. At the same time, other countries enshrine the definition of marriage in their constitution as the union of a man and a woman. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. And in light of last weekend's in your face came on, this could not have come at a better time. Thank you. You're welcome, Mr. Eden. We will now turn to consider the approach. Mr. Miller, you have a question, sir? On HCA1, yes. Correct, yes, sir. Uh, just just a, a request. I notice in the description of this that it, it offers poly advi policy sorry, advice on policing, immigration, prison, fire, and other matters. Um, I wonder if the uh, Premier would give an undertaking in the advent that we're getting a new chief of police to see if we can get written into the policy a, some commitment to provide Northside with some kind of uh, police coverage 24-7 as opposed to just um, a drive through um, two or three times a day. Mr. McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, that sort of detail, um, those are really operational issues. And um, the acting commissioner of police is here and able to answer questions. But obviously with a new commissioner imminent, a whole new look is going to be taken at the way policing um, is administered in these islands. And obviously those sort of considerations uh, will be paramount. And so I've just, rather than given the particular undertaking that the member is asking, I give the undertaking that the whole uh, review of the entire way that, that the police um, service is administered will be on the way when the new commission arrives. And uh, I hope we will be able to wind up with, a, with an approach which meets favor with this house and the broader community. Thank you, Mr. Premier. 
It, um, Mr. Miller. And of course, I would have played for East End and the whole the whole Eastern Command. Um, and the reason I raise it now, um, Mr. Premier, is because my experience over the last two decades is that every time we have a restructuring of the police, we seem to be moving resources from the Eastern Command to other areas. And, and I fully understand their rationale that crime is greater in West Bay and Georgetown than Bordentown, Northside and East End. But my concern and the concern of the wider community is I can remember when there was no crime in West Bay too, and Georgetown. And I believe that police presence offers a deterrent because the criminals are figuring out that if the resources are in Georgetown and West Bay, the Eastern Districts is right for picking. So I thank you for, for your commitment. Mr. Chairman, just let me address a, a more broader policy consideration, if, if I might. I knew that I was, um, I was setting myself up for a, a very stressful situation by accepting responsibility for the police budget because I have almost zero control over or, or influence over over the, the policy relating to policing under the Constitution. Um, that still is firmly within the remit of the governor. I have advocated for many, many years that that is not really an acceptable situation and that responsibility for national security ought to be within the remit of the local legislature and that in terms of overall responsibility for the police service, that that ought to reside in a police authority or police commission or something like that, rather than this um, awkward and unwieldy situation that we have where it is the responsibility of the, of the governor and ultimately the governor gets to make all of those broader policy decisions. <laughs> Operationally, it is within the responsibility of the police commissioner, but the government, the elected government, and in this case me as, as the minister with responsibility for the budget, is the one that has to face the fire and answer the questions. And um, I don't think that a situation can be allowed to, to continue indefinitely this way. And certainly if I am around in another dispensation, the next dis dispensation, I am going to press really hard for the establishment of a police authority, uh, which will at least devolve some more um, control to the, the, the elected government rather than the, the situation that we have. None of, the, none of what I'm saying is intended as any criticism of Her Excellency or how she's managing things. And I have an excellent working relationship with her. It is just constitutionally, it is not, it is not a good fit anymore. Thank you. Mr. McLean, you have a question? Then Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I couldn't have said it better myself. The Premier um, quite eloquently laid out my thoughts over the years as well, and maybe for that matter, many of us, all of us in here, I can only speak for me, but I, I think that many of us are in somewhat in line with what his, his thoughts are. Um, Having said that, though, he, he did say that there will be changes in the methods. So despite the problems... Mr. Mr. Chairman, just let me say, I don't know what, whether there are going to be changes. I'm saying there's going to be a review. So I don't know what is going to come out of that. I don't want to put myself on the line as having undertaken that there will be changes. But my understanding was that you, you said initially that the, the, the way of policing will definitely bring, they will, the review should bring some changes to, yeah. Um, my, my, despite whatever we went through to get there, at least we have one hopefully on that front. But certainly still, there is that opportunity 
for what Mr. Miller asked, for the political directory to see whatever, however we do policing in the future, there must be 24 of those 365 days service on par, up to par what is required on the eastern end and that can be, that policy can move forward with merging in to whatever changes we do. Is that not possible from the political directorate? Because what it requires then is the actual funding to do that. But it will be a policy for the country. Well, well Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know, and the, the longer in the tooth I become, the, I don't know that the answer to all of these issues is necessarily more resources, which is the you know, constant refrain, regardless of what it is. Um, it, it, right, it, it may well be a different approach in terms of, of, of structure and the way that the, the service is administered. Uh, what I can say to members here is that we are approving a budget for 18 months, but nothing is cast in, in stone. And the longer out you are from the, the expiration of the budget, in this case, not 12 months, but 18, they are bound to be, um, there is bound to be the need for, for changes and adjustments. That happens in the general course of, of things. And the undertaking I will make is that if we come through this review process and the government is persuaded that additional resources are something to be able to provide effective policing, we will look again at our numbers and see where adjustments can be made. But I don't want to preempt that exercise now with the commissioner still not yet in post. Mr. McLean, can you speak into the microphone? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, but the, the Premier will commit the political directorate to um, recommending 24 hour service throughout the country, and in particular, the Eastern Districts, because I believe in Georgetown it's, it's a little different. Mr. Chairman, the, the member is, is getting to be very good. Put that way, it's an undertaking I can give. Thank you. And remember, I remember well. Mr. 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 Conley was before you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Conley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to uh, the Premier. I'm glad to hear that there, there is going to be some overview because this is exactly what we were seeing early in the year in that the fact that the NSC hasn't met means that governance and management is from a citizen's representative perspective wasn't there. Um, Mr. Chairman, just let, just let me say, I don't want, really don't want to interrupt, but the, the NSC has met. I think what the member is saying, it hasn't met as regularly as perhaps he would. Well, yesterday, Mr. Premier, through you, we, we heard that it it hadn't met in this calendar year or last calendar year. No, they said or, three, sorry. Or, three or four times in the last yeah. year. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. But what what we what we didn't hear was again the, the the things that the public has said in in meetings leading up to our, our meeting on the police services. The the people wanted to, to hear what was happening to about the responsibility for the break-ins in the police station, the thefts, and all those things. We haven't heard those things for, for people. When, when we went to Prospect and, 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 and Scranton and heard that, you know, what the people's wants were, they, they want to know that someone is listening and, and acting on, on their behalf in, in these things. And I just think under this section, in whatever review that we we do, we need to include the the people of um, the country in in some of those um, lead ups 
because they're the people that are requiring the service. They're the people needing the service. And they're the ones that can see whether or not the service is being perceived, uh, how the service is being perceived and delivered. And, you know, in, in that also should be some kind of citizen oversight of the police service. So I'm, I'm just, you know, suggesting that in whatever review is, is, is undertaken on behalf of the people, accountability, governance, um, and perception that the people need to be involved in the process and should ultimately have some kind of oversight in, in, in the police services. Thank you. If I may just be, we are early in the, early in the days of, or the, the hours of this, of today. And um, I just want to ask that we keep the comments, and que keep the comments on minimum and the questions on point. Um, I'm getting a lot of comments in relation to issues that were already raised during the budget debate. And right now I just want us to keep the questions to the appropriation groups specifically. So if we could if we could just keep that down but because I, I Mr. Chair, but just uh, in in there's a point or I mean what I asked is based on this 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 policy section ACA one. Are you no. saying that, that that wasn't the case? There was a there was a you asked a question that had already been dealt with yesterday, and that was the only question that was in there. The rest of it was things that you had said previously. So n don't take it personal, Mr. Conley. It's, I'm just trying to keep I, us on I'm track. Not, I'm not taking it personal, Mr. Chair. I'm just saying that in this setting, on Finance Committee, on, under these policy statements, I'm asking the questions as it pertains to this. If I said this in, Mr. A, in a previous Mr. Premier, setting. Was there a question uh, in there other than the statement that Finance Committee, that um, National Security Council hadn't met. Was there a question in there? I asked that the citizens of the country be, uh, whether or not they would be um, taken into consideration when this review was going on. That, that's me asking for commitment on their behalf. Mr. Premier. Well, Mr. Chairman, what I can say, in, uh, I'm glad he has um, crystallized a, a question because that I, didn't, I hadn't discerned one. But I think what the member is asking for is that in the in the review that is proposed by the new commissioner, that there is a public consultation process so that those views can be taken on board. I don't know if I can give that on taking on behalf of the commissioner or the, the commissioner to come, but I can certainly give an on the taking on behalf of the government that that is something we will strongly advocate. And I don't see any new commissioner not wanting to do that. Thank you. Mr. Miller, Mr. Mr. Conley, that's satisfactory? the commitment on behalf of the government as opposed to the commissioner? Mr. Chairman, it, it might help, especially for the newer members of the House, if I spoke a little bit about the National Security Council because there are a great deal of, um, I can't say misconceptions, that's probably wrong, expectations about the role of this, of this council, um, that the way it has worked um, just don't, don't allow. The, the National Security Council that we contemplated when we were trying to, to develop this constitution was aimed at allowing for the elected government and ultimately the leader of the opposition to be able to, and some private sector people, two private sector people, to actually exert some, some authority and decision making over the way national security was handled in the country. Unfortunately, from the very outset, despite what in my view are the clear words of the section, which says that the governor, let me read it. The National Security Council shall advise the governor on matters relating to internal security with the exception of operational and staffing matters and the governor shall be obliged to act in accordance with the advice of the council unless he or she considers that giving effect to the advice would adversely affect Her Majesty's interest, whether in respect of the United Kingdom or the Cayman Islands. And where the governor has acted otherwise in accordance with the advice of the council, he or she shall report to the council at its next meeting. So to, to the lawyer in me, advice in that sense is 
It's like the advice that, as Premier, I give to the Governor that I want to appoint um, Kurt Tibbetts as, as Minister of Planning or Mark Archer as Minister of Finance and Economic Development. It's not advice um, that, that, that you can ignore. But from the outset of the Constitution, the view was taken on advice, on, on legal advice, that this council is advisory only in nature and that it, it doesn't really matter what the, the, the members of the council say, ultimately the governor can decide to do one thing or the other. I thought, and this is not something new, I've said for the first time, I've said this when I was in the opposition, as leader of the opposition sitting on the council, that that is constitutionally wrong. But the, the, the result of the way the game is, is played now is that really the elected government um, doesn't exercise any, or this council doesn't exercise any real um, influence over national security policy. And I think that that is a huge mistake on the part of the, of, um, the FCO because I believe that given the way things have developed and are continuing to develop, that what, what the local um, people, and I say that because it includes the private sector people, not just the elected ones, have to say about these matters um, can be very, very helpful to the kind of policy uh, considerations that are taken into account. Obviously, operational issues are a separate matter. We don't want to get into telling the commissioner where he should go, where he should deploy men, and so forth. That's, that's not what we should be doing. And the Constitution is quite clear that that's not the role of the National Security Council. But I do believe even, even without having a police authority that I spoke of earlier, if the National Security Council um, were to function in the way that we conceived it would function when we were drafting the Constitution, overall, we would be in a much better place as it relates to national security issues. Thank you, Mr. Premier. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Miller first, then Mr. Bush. Mr. Miller. Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, can the Premier confirm that all shifts at the fire station in Frank Sound meet requirements for, this is the policy, meets the requirements of the law? Mr. Premier? No, Mr. Chairman, the reason I'm hesitating is um, we're dealing with, with policy, with the sort of broad, broad policy advice matters now. Um, I would prefer, it would be easier to manage if we reserved fire questions till when I have the fire officer, the okay. chief fire officer here. Thank you. Mr. 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 Miller. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I was Mr. talking Bush. about the, the, what the Premier was talking about. I wanted to, to voice an observation there. Yes, sir. That the Premier is somewhat right in the way that the Foreign Office has viewed the work of the National Security Council. But, and, and we told them they were wrong, but they're wrong in many things in this country, and we're not saying so. And, and we seem to take it lightly, and perhaps members in this House takes it lightly, perhaps they don't want to, some, some don't want to, to voice their opinions and be heard. And we sit back and allow them to do it, and then our people, as Mr. Connolly is saying, is questioning us. Where do we stand? That's not the only one that they got it wrong. They, they, they got it wrong also with the Constitutional Commission, where the, the governor is controlling all these commissions, and they have no right to do so, and it was not constitutional, even if it's not what is the understanding when you make that constitution is what should prevail. And it's, it's not happening. And Caymanians are demanding matters to happen. The elected government can do it because the, the, how, how it's being operated. We can't even ask them the questions in, in National Security Council. He will, the commissioner of police will send his deputy, who's very rude, 
and, and, and try to insult you, as members know they have tried to do with me, uh, of course I don't stop. I keep going. Thank you. My observation. Thank you. If there are no further questions, Mr. McLean, you have a question? Mr. Chairman, I, I want to ask the Premier on the matter that he just uh, expounded upon. If it is his will, desire, intent to look at amending us going to make the necessary amendments to the Constitution in the interest of quote-unquote good governance, which we have been thrown around here for quite some while by those who would be the ones who are making these interpretations that he believes is wrong, and I do too, I want you to know that. Um, if it is his intention for us to try to engage changes in the Constitution to have them corrected. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I don't believe in this, in this instance that what is necessary is a constitutional change. I think the Constitution is very clear. I think what is necessary is a change in attitude to the role that the elected government and the private sector persons who comprise the National Security Council um, should have in relation to national security. And you know, we, we can challenge, it, or we could challenge the, their interpretation through the courts. But of course, if, if, if we don't get a change in attitude as far as the FCO is concerned, they'll just make the necessary adjustments to cover. As long as they want to retain this kind of control, they'll find a way to do it. So I think that, that the work has to c continue to be on persuading them. And uh, about this and Her Excellency and I have had um, a couple of discussions about the, the whole concept of police authority as well. And I believe that certainly in relation to that, that that is something we can do without a need for a constitutional change. It just requires political will and the agreement of the FCO because ultimately, as you know, the governor has to assent to whatever bills we pass down here. So that's you certainly the approach that I, that's the approach that I am taking in re with respect to this. Yeah. Thank you. All those in favor of HCA1 policy advice and ministerial services on home affairs. Mr. Chairman, before matters. you take the vote on this, where do we discuss the matters of the, um, Elections, office, political, and, and, and policies there too. It's on the, not on the, not on the, the home affairs. No, we don't want elections on the you. You have enough say in them as, as it is. Thank you. All those, all those in favor of HCA1, policy advice and ministerial services on home affairs matters for four million. $585,019, standing part of the schedule to the bill, please say aye. Aye. Those against no. HCA2, licensing services, $1,062,371. Are there any questions? Mr. McLean? Mr. Chairman, I, the, the, the Premier at some stage early on in this, session said that he was going to bring some changes to the licensing processes. Um, and I'm wondering, uh, this is of the firearms law, and I'm wondering if the Premier has considered those and if they will be, if they're forthcoming. Mr. Premier. Mr. Chairman, what the government is, is, I'm not sure if this is, because I can't remember precisely when, what I said and when I said it, uh, about that, about firearms generally. But what I can say is that what the government is considering um, is in relation to the use of air rifles, um, amendments to regulations with respect to that, to, to enable the use of, of the, uh, 
wider use of rules, particularly with respect to the culling of the green iguana. We are not contemplating, as far as I'm aware, anyhow, any broader changes to firearms um, legislation. Well, Mr. Chairman, Mr. if I may remind the, the, the Premier, um, what we discussed was the creation of a, a committee authority or something of that nature because Mr. Miller and I were going to, were contemplating bringing the motion and, 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 and I think he, the Premier asked us to hold off on it until he, he could consider it because two JPs, two or three JPs or something of that nature. Yeah, it, it was some time ago, maybe two and a half years ago. And, and, and um, because, the, and the other part was that we discussed also, was this thing about uh, police clearance. You gotta go to the office, pay for that with your passport. Then you go back, pick it up. Then you go back, put it in, same office when it could be a, a, a cost placed on the applicant and because, and a copy of their, their passport page, which is all they take anyway, and then the research is done right there and you don't have the paperwork and you don't have the, the, the hassle. Those are the little things that, that I was thinking about. And with regards to the, 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 making it broader for your gun, air rifles. I am a little aware of that because some of those air rifles are, it still need to be scrutinized on character and that kind of stuff. We, we, let's not get it too broad. That's what I need to suggest. Well, uh, with respect to the last point, Mr. Chairman, when, when um, the cabinet has actually taken a decision, I'll be in a position to to speak more in more detail about what the government is proposing with respect to that. But I thank the member for reminding me about the discussion we had about the um, permitting the use of, of firearms and whether that, it's all come back to me now, whether all of that authority ought to rest or repose in the commissioner. And we had discussed the possibility of broadening, the, the, shall I call it the committee, who got granted or, or dealt with these applications to include justices of the peace. So thank, having reminded me of that, I will take that forward again, and I'll have the necessary discussions and see where we get to. But it, it, quite frankly, it had fallen off my radar. I, I, I completely forgotten about it over the course of the last couple of years. And I, I thank Mr. Chairman, I thank the Premier, but. I should also bring to the premier attention that no matter where you go, we see one of our colleagues were gunned down the street in England just yesterday. Or today, today, sometime today. And that's something we need to, and not necessarily for us, but when we broaden these things out, we need to be extremely careful that it doesn't have an adverse effect on us from the other side. You know, you, you arm everybody legally, and then everybody says expect that they'll be armed, should 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 have the right to be armed and do it illegally as well. So those are the things that we need to be very wary of. Well, Mr. Chairman, I want to be quick to say that the government is not proposing anything to um, to allow easier access to firearms, not, not at all. That's the, that's the last thing that we are, we are suggesting. And the, the note that I got about the unfortunate incident with the MP um, in the UK, and it's a lady as well, I understand, was the, was the use of a homemade um, gun. So. Thank you, Premier. All those in favor of HCA2 licensing services, one million and sixty-two thousand three hundred seventy-one dollars, standing part of the schedule for the bill. Please say aye. Aye. Those against, no. 
HCA3, Enforcement of Immigration Laws, $2,470,018 on page 60. Are there any questions? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bush. Mr. Chairman, I, I had one, one question on immigration matters. It has more to do with, I guess, board handling of the matters. And, and what, I, what I am finding, Mr. Chairman, is that people who get married to Caymanian it's taking a mighty long time to get their certificate to enable them to work. I, I think it's, everything got an abbreviation today, and can't, so many, well, their certificate to work. Yes, R-E, R-C, yeah, you said, thanks. And it is, it is creating quite a bit of problem uh, people are taking a long time to get it, over a year in some instances. And, Mr. Mr. Chairman, now I don't know all the faults because we've gotten so heavy with the bureaucracy in this country that it, it, takes, for, it takes 18 pages to do a mere application for something, small as it may be sometimes. And it is, it is having an effect on families. Now, Mr. Chairman, the board has to do their work uh, in marriages of Caymanians and nationalities to ensure, other nationalities, to ensure that advantage is not taken on either side and that there is no marriage of convenience. But that, can't, that should not take the amount of time that is being taken for for that to happen. And I know of a couple of cases, and it's causing severe uh, hardship because uh, maybe rich people that marry Caymanians or Caymanian wealthy people that marry foreign persons are okay. But for working families, that weddings, those kind of weddings that are performed, marriages are performed, um, the spouse has to work. And it's not, it is not, it, 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 is, it is bringing hardship. And I don't see the reason for it. If they have a doubt on the marriage, the boards are supposed to be made up with people from the districts that know people. That's how we always appointed board members. Uh, at least when I made an appointment, I wanted to make an appointment or a suggestion that the person who put on have a knowledge in the district to know people. Um, the other thing is that they can, they can, Mr. Chairman, call the marriage officer in and, and get his, his opinion if there is some kind of doubt. Um, well, I don't know the situation. I, I really don't know. Uh, I find that, that the, the immigration, at least I got to speak of things as I find them. If I call uh, immigration department, I am going to get a response quickly and I'm going to get, I'm done with courtesy. I have no questions about the leadership there presently. Um, I, I don't find any fault there. I'm not, so I'm not making any complaint of that. Um, I don't know whether it's, it's a departmental issue or whether it is, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, the if board. We, but if, I, if I can help um, the leader of the opposition by saying that these are operational issues. We have the acting chief immigration officer here. Perhaps it's easier if I just ask him to come and mm -hmm. explain the mm. little list, okay? He's a good man, he comes from a good district. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Bush, can you repeat the question so that, because he wasn't in the chamber um, when you spoke. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith, was talking about the, the issuance of, of the, the certificates to allow spouses of Caymanians to be employed. And um, that it, some of them are taking a, a long time and I'm finding it's bringing hardship. 
in essence. That's what I would say. And, and to, if there is a problem, then me, you know, we need to just get it unraveled because I know it's taking some, some cases nearly a year or a year to, to happen. Maybe, as I say, this application-wise and some mistakes made, but we, it can't take, these can't, things can't take that long. Mr. Smith. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, member. Sometimes first, first, first state your name and title for the record. Pardon me. Uh, Bruce Smith, Acting Chief Immigration Officer, Department of Immigration. Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> In relation to the facility that the member has mentioned, the Residency Employment Rights Certificate for Persons Married to Kimanyan, we recognize that there is a delay, um, but sometimes it is the length of time that the persons wait in which they apply for the facility. And of course, the, the waiting period that they choose, um, or the length of time that they choose to make the application is beyond our control. We have found from time to time that materially, the application is missing information, um, pertinent information. And sometimes um, there's, um, matrimonial uh, disputes from, from, from our experience. But I can say uh, to the member that we will we'll make every effort to ensure that once we get an application in our possession, that we will uh, in make sure that the application is dealt with swiftly. And if there is no issues um, from an administrative standpoint, we will move to make the decision. Mr. Chairman, I take what the, Mr. Smith is saying, but I, I know of, of personal cases, and I don't know, and these are boards that are calling in people. Um, there could be an issue with, like I said, the application process where somebody just miss out something and it's not done, but reacts quickly to it. But it can't take from July last year to this July and nothing happened yet. And it can't, and, and if it is so, that they have a doubt because we know we live in a small place and two people getting married, Caymanian get married to a foreign national, somebody mightn't like it, and, and don't ask if they will tell lie. They will tell lie sometime. But that is for the board to find out. And they can only do that by interviews or going out to find out for themselves. In, the, in such cases, they can call on marriage officers. I am a marriage officer. I've been since 1986. Been taken very careful when I do a wedding to make sure that there is no um, marriage of convenience. When the first word was brought in this assembly, I raised it <coughs> back in the 80s. And so I'm very careful of it, S especially since I was also instrumental in getting the, getting the fees. But, but we, we certainly need to do something about it. And if they, if, they, if they have a problem with that, what they can do is call in the marriage officer and, and try to resolve it. Because where, where there are no complaints, I don't see why it takes such, as I said, for a year for it to happen. And I, these are things that I don't understand, but I do understand the hardships that are caused because children are involved, and, and so there is a need for people to work. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Mr. Smith, is, if there's a question in there, you can answer. Um, I'm not sure of the, of, of the, of the question, okay. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Mr. All I'm saying is, I, I am making observations mm -hmm. about the matter. I'm, I'm trying to find out what the situation is. I, I think Mr. Smith has supplied two answers to the situation. I know that these matters are drawn out, but it can't be drawn out. Come on. It can't be drawn out that long, from July to July, or, you know, months and months. Sorry? Mr. Smith. Yeah, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, to the member. Um, he's speaking on, on delays. I don't know specifically what particular application that is being referred, but I certainly will, we will, will review all applications 
and we will review uh, with, along with the boards administratively and with the boards what issues may be um, impacting the timeliness of applications. In, in relation to um, suspicions and, and good reasons for us, our, our suspicions to suspect that a marriage might not be um, genuine in terms of the immigration context. And it's only the immigration context that we, are, we have jurisdiction. Um, convenience is only for an immigration benefit. We will actively pursue um, you know, the, the collective board, the Cayman Status and Permanent Residence Board, and our enforcement office will actively deal with reports and exhaust all measures to our ability and capacity to arrive at a, at a conclusion. Uh, sometimes, of course, I may add that these conclusions are not as easily um, arrived at because it is difficult sometimes to determine for an immigration benefit that a marriage is arranged or is, is of convenience. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Mr. McLean, Mr. Thank Bush, you had a supplementary? Or you no, I, I, I only want to say that it's taken a mighty long time, and I, I, I do believe that if, if it's a marriage of convenience on, a, on an immigration issue, it's, that should be very easy to find. I know the situation. I, I had some discussion with Mr. Smith before on this, but I think it's, it's more than that. And I can have a further discussion with him, and I care not to go further on it. I've been involved with it a long time, so. Thank you, Mr. Bush. Mr. McLean, and then Mr. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, the acting chief immigration officer um, mentioned some of the reasons why these there are delays. And he, he said matrimonial disputes. Uh, could he explain without pointing at anyone the, what matrimonial dispute would stop someone from getting a RERC? Mr. Smith? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Through you to the member. Thank you, member, for the question. Um, I specifically was thinking of the Caymanian spouse um, declaring to us that he or she may not be in favor of, of the application, and we've had that experience before. Um, and, and of course, these each time the situation is dealt with and considered on its own merit. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't understand that because, as I know it, they have to countersign that application. So you're saying between submitting it and you issuing it, it changed your mind? Mr. Smith? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to the member, that is, that is correct. Um, we are ready to put place our, our decision and information would come from one of the key par parties to the application. That is beyond our control, but nevertheless, it requires our attention. And that has been a reason that has impeded the progress of dealing with an application. But, but sir, Mr. Chairman, that's no delay. That shouldn't cause a delay. Immediately send it back to them, to the, to the, to the, to the sender. Just send it back to sender. That's no delay. That one is off your books. That one was dealt with. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. McLean, sorry. Mr. I, Mr. Chairman, I take the member's point. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, can the Chief Immigration Officer say in light of the fact that the number of um, people coming here, the, what I believe is the increasing demand for enforcement, why the enforcement vote has been reduced by $118,000 for the year 2017 over 2015-16? Because I won't make a statement, I'll just ask the question. Mr. Smith? 
Yeah. Mr. Chairman, grab your indulgence for a moment, please. Sure. Mr. Chairman, if I might invite the member to compare under the, the quantity section, um, to compare the number of case files created and the number of administrative fines levied, you will see that there's a significant, proposed significant increase in the use of the administrative fines process. And the view is taken that this is a much more effective means of dealing with enforcement than trying to run these matters through the court and therefore a corresponding uh, reduction in the amount of work that is necessary to achieve more significant enforcement. Uh, just, just a follow-up. To, to you, Mr. Chairman, um, 20 15-16 over 2014-15 was increased by $123,000. We were told then that that was to increase the number of enforcement officers to deal with the problem. Is the department now suggesting that the advent of administrative fines and the efficiency that that brings to it, they are now in a position to reduce staff? Mr. Mr. Chairman, apologize for the delay, but there's, a, there's another, just let me continue to address the, the first um, point I made. I've also been advised that the use of the administrative fines has another um, benefit to it in that the department gets the benefit of those fines as en entity revenue and therefore the cost of operating the department to cabinet is correspondingly reduced. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I then ask why that number is not represented here as it is with other subheads where it says that it costs X dollars, but because we get X income, the amount requested has been reduced? Because if that if it had been on the paper, I probably would not have asked the question. That, that's a good point. Let me see if I have the answer.
Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, the, the member has made a, a very valid point, which we will need to address. Um, because because you, we know that on the on the page to the left, there is a note, you know, addressing that particular point, which isn't the same here. Mr. McLean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my question is basically on the same lines um, about how we reduct the reduction and what is happening with compliance with work permit conditions by work permit holders through the task force. The, the, what do you call it? Enforcement arm? I think it's called. I, I, I want to know, in the past, I know we have memory of the enforcement arm going out on the street, going on jobs, catching people who were not complying with the condition of their work permit. They got work, the, the work permit was issued for A, and they're working at B. I believe that's one of the, the greatest impediments to Caymanians getting a job. How are we dealing with it? So, Mr. Chairman, if I can try to distill what the question is. Uh, is the member asking for the, the number of instances in which, um, in, in which, or, or cases that are being prosecuted for that, or incidents investigated? I'm trying to understand what, what I'm trying, to, what, what is that being asked to answer specifically? Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'm asking, in essence, are we still employing those methods of control and work permits to ensure they com the work permit holder comply with the conditions? Mr. Chairman, I'll ask the, the answer, the short answer is yes, but I'll ask the chief, acting chief immigration officer to perhaps provide some more detail. Thank you. Mr. Smith? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Member. Uh, the answer to that is yes. We are deploying the same um, attention. We do act uh, a bit different than we, we acted before in terms of using certain um, intelligence and other strategies to make our work a bit easier and, and be more deliberate in how we um, affect our, our approach. Um, or conditions that have been applied, uh, work permits that obviously have been approved, have been approved by, by law and any deviation from that um, that comes to our attention. Uh, we will actively sir, pursue, pursue um, to the best of our abilities to ensure that any breach of the immigration law that has been reported is duly identified and action is suitable, appropriate action is taken. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I wonder if the, the Premier or Director can tell us how many of those we have had, as opposed to the administrative fines, because administrative fines is usually someone calling the office and that kind of stuff, and, and um, people are working, their work permit has been expired or they never came or something of that nature. That is, is the, the office knows about, that is at their fingertips. But those that are out there working at a different, a job different to, to where the work permit was issued for, how many of those have we caught? Have we prosecuted or, um, or had intervention with. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the member. Um, we arrested 126 persons. Uh, 537 persons were brought in for questioning in relation to various immigration um, concerns. 
Um, 354 persons were administratively fined, of which they agreed to go that route instead of through um, court action. Uh, this was between, um, Mr. Chairman, to you, to the member, this was from the 1st of July until June of this year. That's the financial financial year. Mr. Okay. Chairman, that's correct. 11 months. Okay. And, and, and since you're so thorough with your, your answer, how much fine, what was the total value of the fine? Just, Mr. Chairman, uh, just crave your indulgence, please. Sure. I'm sure it'll make up over 100,000 of what you're missing here. The, the total was uh, 372,761 that was imposed and we collected 364,296. 364,000. 364,000. Yes. And cabinet only reduced it by 100,000. They're keeping the rest on manure. Who's being Who's being I'm not feeling it all about. <laughs> That's 200,000 you're being short that you should be, should be available for your use to, to enhance that program, in my view. Um, do you agree, compared with this, the reduction in it here? It's up to you if you want That's to answer. You don't, you don't have to. It's up to you. It's an opinion he's asking for. You Thank didn't you. hear the question Thank behind that. You can't put an opinion on my question, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect. Mr. I ask Mr. if McLean that is his view. Precisely. And that's an opinion. But that's not an opinion. It is. You're asking him how... I put it to him then it. that that's the case. Exactly. So then it's up to him if he wants to answer the question. Mr. Smith, it is still up to you. You want to answer the question. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I take the member's point. Thank you. We will proceed to the vote. Mr. Miller. Uh, through you to the Chief Immigration Officer. Does the enforcement arm have enough resources to do undercover work? Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, member. I would, I would say that the demands on the department and the demands on the department uh, from the immigration enforcement side, uh, there is always the peaks and, and valleys uh, in our um, activities. And when it comes to uh, covert operations, covert activities, these are special planned and we would regard that the need to go uh, covert as a special, uh, in terms of a special operation, we would have prioritized the need and set objectives and ensured that the manpower uh, to carry out, effectively carry out. And we also use other agencies to offset um, some of the deficiencies that we may have at the time based on the need. Normally these um, Operations are, are very time sensitive and we don't have um, the pleasure of, of planning uh, for long term. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Miller, you had a follow-up question, sir? Um, just to, just to, 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 to ask the um, Chief Immigration Officer, particularly in the faraway places like Northside, Trumpet, I often observe people working outside of their permits. Um, 
And when I reported to immigration, there is sometimes a delay in them acting in a covert way because of what I believe is a lack of resources. And if the chairman will, 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 will permit me, I'll give you a, a for instance. For instance, I go to a restaurant in my constituency and I see somebody working as a waiter who I have observed all the time in the past working as a gardener. And when I reported to the immigration department, there is some difficulty in the immigration department to respond in a timely manner to catch the person in the act, so to speak. So I just want to make sure that we're providing you with the resources because I believe we need to be in a position to respond quickly and effectively to those because I believe that your, your, your administrative fine should be over a million dollars, some of the things I see, and, and the complaints that I get from Caymanians of people on all specters on their work permits, working outside their work permits. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Mr. Smith. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, to the member. Um, we, we appreciate that, um, and we do find ourselves from time to time um, a bit um, understaffed because of other commitments that require the, the lion's share of, of the, the officers. We, we do use um, our intelligence unit to assist in substantiating some of, of, of the reports and complaints that, that we have. But I do respect, um, sir, the fact that you witnessed this and from your local knowledge, you could see that it was something not right and you're reporting it to us. I, I will say that all officers, including the high command of the enforcement, is mindful that all reports should be responded to. Um, and we will, we will do our best going, going forward. And, and Mr. Chairman, just let me explain that the response that I have gotten from your officers in most cases have been exemplary. Just need to tell your son, Ford and son back in town. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. McLean, you had a question, sir? Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, through you to the Premier or the Director, is it a fact that if you're, it's an offense, when you have been issued with a work permit and you do not take up the work profession, whatever it is, that that work permit is issued for, and you do nothing. Is that not also breaking the law? Mr. Smith? Did you thank, have a thank, you. thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, 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 the, the, the taking up of a work permit, so once a work permit has been duly um, applied for, and it has gone through the process, and a decision has been made in the case of granting it, the expectation is then that the, the worker will commence immediately at the point of the approval, going through the process of notification and everything else. In the event that for some reason the worker does not avail himself to, to the, uh, the employer, uh, and we do not get information does not necessarily constitute an offense because there's no work being, no, nobody's working. Um, I think uh, from an econ economic standpoint, the um, employer would be best to cancel that so that perhaps he, he could or she could get a refund if the work permit is not going to be actioned. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, if I may, not when it is very lucrative for them because they have them out there selling numbers. 
the permit is asked for on the one thing and they never take up that job and there are many people in this country now who sell numbers all day long and they're on work permit. That is where I'm going. That needs to stop. That, that's breach of many laws. But somehow the coordination that you have with other uniform branches, um, my, I'm asking for a commitment that that be addressed and soon because that breeds much more subculture than any other subculture, bad subculture, than any other subculture that we can have in this country, whether it's living conditions or not. But this is the subculture that is creeping in that is going to cause us problems. Thank you, Mr. McLean. Mr. Smith. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the member for that point. We are aware of activities that from time to time um, are undertaken. Of course, it's, it's um, done in a, in a way to, to mask really what is happening. And in that case, in relation to the worker who was approved a work permit for a specific uh, purpose or service or occupation, that is where then the offense of working outside the terms of that approval or work permit will, will actually occur. Then the uh, engaging in, in, the, in um, illegal activities such as gambling and, and chance is then another uh, penal matter. Is, Mr. Chairman, is it also not to the director, is it not, not, not all, also not an offense committed by the person who submitted for that work permit also? That that employer, quote unquote, is allowing the employee on work permit to engage in practices outside what they were issued the work permit for? Mr. Smith? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> the answer to that would be uh, most often yes, is that the, the, the employer has the work permit in favor of that person to carry out particular services for that individual. The um, evidentiary side of it would have to also be considered as to whether or not knowledge um, of, of the offense. Of course, all of that would be taken into consideration as to who is, is involved and who, um, as far as, as suspecting people, who they are and all the players. But that certainly is part and parcel of dealing with that kind of report. Thank you. If there are no further questions, oh, sorry, Mr. Sukul. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For you, um, how does the department deal with with uh, whistleblowers in terms of people who want to report violations of the immigration law, and it may be in relation to a work permit application or a renewal, but those individuals may be employed at the same business or organization, because that's one of the most common complaints I get from people is that they'd like to point things out, but they can't because they fear then for, you know, that there may be some retaliation against them. Is, is there, and, and I think the, the perception is, is that the only way to alert the department is to write a letter and have it go on the person's file, and then they have a right to face their accuser. But then I know the police operates, like the difference where, you know, you can talk to um, the police and raise a concern and then their intelligence people can go and verify whether or not there is an actual issue you know is there some protection for whistleblowers now other than having to write a letter and have it go on the file thank you mr Sukul. mr smith thank you mr chairman thank you for the member for that question our compliance unit um which is a relatively new unit has actively been involved in dealing with companies, um, individuals, uh, 
and we regard, to, to your point, sir, we regard the, the sensitivity of and, and sensitiveness of persons wanting to come forward, but certainly don't want to be exposed. Our, intel, our intelligence, intelligence office, along with the compliance unit, do deal with occasions, on, on occasions with these type of people. And it is not to the point where we will expose them or allow them to be exposed by way of correspondence because we realize then that once that information goes on the file, then it's, it, it can be um, applied for through the, FO, the Freedom of Information Law. So we, we, the confidentiality of these type of individuals that are so brave, and I say it's so brave to come forward, we welcome them and, and, and deal with them with the respect that is due. Thank you, Mr. Smith. All those in favor of HCA3, Enforcement of Immigration Laws, $2,470,018, not being part of the schedule to the bill, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. HCA4. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, with, um, with your permission, sir, I've, I've just been advised that Member of Parliament Joe Cox, age 41, Labour MP for Bartley and Spen in the United Kingdom has succumbed to the injuries inflicted on her this morning, having been shot twice. She has now died. And I just, on behalf of the government and members of this house, would like to extend our, our condolences to her husband, Brendan Cox, and her family and express our or deep sadness at, at her tragic death. And with your permission, sir, I would suggest that members of the House stand for a moment of silence in, in her memory and, and to express our, our support for her, her family at this um, terrible time. Thank you, Premier. We'll do so. Thank you. We will now resume. HCA4, processing status and permanent residency certificates, 267,000. $267,398 on page 6-1. All those in favor of HCA-4, processing status and permanent residency certificates, $267,398, standing part of the schedule to the bill, please say aye. 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 Those against, no. I'm being asked by the Premier if we can take the luncheon break now because he has something else to attend to. So we will break for one hour until and we return here at 1.30 p.m. Okay, I understand.